So, we started um, last week on this kind of concept of foreshadowing, and we, we said we we're going to look at it over the coming weeks, and um, really what it is, just for those who weren't here, is foreshadowing is kind of when something that happened in the past is giving us a picture or representing or giving us an idea of something that is to come in the future. And uh, I use that picture of like if you're walking up to the corner of a building and the sun is shining from the other side and you see there's someone coming around the corner and you see their shadow on the pavement coming as you come up to the corner before you see them. And the shadow represents them. It's not them. And it gives you some details or some ideas of them, but it doesn't show you everything about them. And what we said is that in the Old Testament, we see a lot of foreshadowing of things that are to come. So a lot of foreshadowing, particularly of Jesus. Jesus is the golden thread that runs through all of Scripture. Scripture points us to Jesus. Our lives should be around Him. One of the, one of the faults I certainly make, and, and I'm getting better at it, but I still make it, is when I read some of the stories and things in the Old Testament, is I, I like to put myself in the story as the hero. You read David and Goliath, and you're like, yeah, buddy, I could have whipped that oak in the head. And you read some of the other stories, Gideon, I could have taken on an army with only 300 guys. I would have also had the idea for the things with the lights inside and break them, and it looks like lots of us, but <laughs> it's, it's a cool story. I mean, you're looking at me like you don't know what's going on. You should, you should stick to your Bible reading program and get through there. It gets, it gets interesting past Leviticus and Numbers. But um, there's, there's a lot in the Old Testament that points forward to what is to come in the New Testament. And so that's what we, we're going to be looking at. And the technical term for that is typology or foreshadowing. So it's something that is a type of what is to come. And so foreshadowing is just easier, just as a, it's an easier picture for me to remember. So hopefully it's helpful to you. And, and just two quick scriptures that in the New Testament give us an idea that this is a thing is Colossians 2, 16 and 17. And it says this, it says, Therefore, uh, do not, it's Paul writing to the church in Colossians, he says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Now, now those things that he's writing about there, he's saying, don't let anyone judge you about those things. Those were things that were spoken of in the Old Testament law. So the, the ceremonial laws that Moses gave and the, the, religion, uh, the national laws that they did for Israel as a nation were some of those things. Paul then goes, he carries on in verse 17, he says, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. So he's saying that those things that God gave them in the Old Testament law were a shadow of what is to come. Obviously, you know, sometimes we think shadows are behind. So it's this concept of foreshadowing that Paul is writing about there. And he says, the reality, however, is found in Christ. So he's saying those things that God gave to the nation of Israel back then, the laws, things about celebrations and when to do stuff and all this sort of thing, what you can, those are a picture of Jesus. And sometimes it can be confusing for us, particularly because we're not Jewish and we don't really have the depth of understanding of those things. But there is a beautiful picture of Jesus in those things. Hebrews 10, the first half of verse 1 says, The law is only a shadow of good things that are coming. They're not the realities themselves. Side note, the law was meant to point people to Jesus. The law was, meant, was never meant to be the thing that saved people. It was never meant to become the main thing. It was always meant to be about Jesus. The Ten Commandments and 624 other edicts that are there, it was never meant to be about rule keeping. It was meant to be about getting to the place of going, man, I'm doing this because I need forgiveness from God and I can't earn it myself. God's got to give it to me. It should point me to a place of faith in God through His own act. Jesus. It was always meant as that. So the Old Testament types of Christ are intentionally placed in Scripture so that we could recognize the Messiah when He came. That was the, the idea. It's God is saying, man, He promised Jesus right back in Genesis chapter 3. He said there's a, there's a seed of Eve that is coming that will crush the head of the serpent. You'll bruise his heel, but he'll crush your head. You read that? It was probably in January you read that. And then it goes on and it says, so that's the it's called the Proto-Evangelion. It's the, it's the first gospel that was preached. Is that Genesis 3.15 promise? I think it's 3.15. And so what God is saying is there's a Messiah coming. And everything else after that is a picture. And we need to look at that and go, hey man, that's Jesus. There's a picture of Jesus. There it is. He's coming. This is what he's going to be like. None of them have the full revelation of who Jesus is. That's Jesus. But they all point to him. And there's some things, we looked at some inanimate things last week that would give us an idea of who Jesus is. So we looked at Noah's Ark, 
um, the lamb of the Passover that was sacrificed, and I can't remember the other three, but they were there. There were some things in that, so go and listen to the sermon. And uh, you can see those inanimate things, so, so things that were not alive that, or, or that were not people. But what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks, aside from Kia next week, is look at people that were foreshadowing of Christ. And today, we're looking at Moses. So, we're looking at the story of Moses. Moses' story starts in, in Genesis, uh, in Exodus, sorry, just after Genesis. Genesis closes with um, the narrative of Joseph, the longest narrative in the Bible, by the way, is Joseph, and we'll, we'll look at him in the coming weeks, but we're starting with Moses. And, and Moses is an incredible anticipationary picture of Jesus, this prophetic picture of who was to come. Now, as we've said, as we look at all of these characters, we must remember that, that Jesus Christ is God's main event. And all of the Old Testament leads up to that thing. So he is, Jesus is the main event that everything else leads up to. And so we get, we have the privilege of reading the Old Testament with Jesus' lenses on when we look at it. We can look for him in the Old Testament when we read it and go, man, how does this, how does this show Jesus? How does this point me to Jesus? What does this teach me about Jesus? Why is he in, like that in that person? And that's kind of what we're going to be, be looking at. All right. So there's, there's more things than what we looked at last week, the inanimate things. Those were just some, some ideas. But if we, if we think about it, there's like when Adam and Eve commit the sin, you know the first thing that God does? It says that they were naked and they felt ashamed. And then you know what it says after that? God clothed them with animal skins. There was a sacrifice. Because of their sin and their shame... There was an animal sacrifice right there. We see it. That's a picture of what Jesus had to do for us. There was a sacrifice because of our sin and shame that then covers us and clothes us. The manna, the bread from heaven. Jesus literally says, I am the bread of heaven. The temple in Jerusalem. We can keep going on and on. But anyway, moving on to Moses. So there's lots of things, events, ceremonies, all of those things that point us to Jesus and show us an aspect or a, a part of the ministry of Jesus. So, um, as we get into Moses, we must realize, again, that those who foreshadow Christ, they are not Christ. He is still Moses. He is a human being. He is amazing. He's incredible. God used him in mighty ways and, and for the others as well. So, it's not those, these people are not Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. They are people who foreshadow Christ who was to come in some way or aspect in their lives. They're still humans. They still have their flaws and failures. And if you've ever written a postgraduate master's or a doctorate or you read one, you'll see in the beginning there's a lot of acknowledgments and thank yous and thank you for this person and thank you for that person. And then the, the writer generally, it's good academic practice, will say, any mistakes in here are my own. They're not because of other people who've helped me. Yeah? Did you put that in yours? You didn't put that. You should have put that in the beginning. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm looking at Ngonzi because I know she's done postgraduate stuff, but... It is, it's the same with these people when we read it. So their flaws and their failures are their own because they're human. And so when we look at them, don't get caught up in those things. So Moses and Jesus. For those who don't know this, the story of Moses, um, Moses born in Egypt during a time of great persecution. The, the leadership in Egypt had changed and they, the Israelites were growing as a nation, and Pharaoh at the time had said, listen, there's too many Hebrews, we're going to kill all the babies, so just to thin out the population a bit, and he called the, the, the midwives in and said, listen, stop, you know, if babies are born, just kill them, boy babies, and the, and the, the midwives sort of said, well, that's a bad idea, we don't really feel that, they didn't say that, but they just didn't do what Pharaoh told them to do, and so the Hebrew babies were born. Moses being one of those, Moses' mother realizing she couldn't keep him, if she kept him, she, he would be killed. She puts him in a basket, sends him down the river, kind of going, yeah, I have to trust God with this child. I'm not going to have him killed, but I'm going to trust God with him. He floats down the river, and Pharaoh's, he floats to where Pharaoh's daughter has come down to bathe. And for me, just as a side caveat, it's such a great picture, and it, that picture has helped me a lot in our adoption of Seth, realize that that Adopt that, that sometimes birth mothers give up babies for adoption because of their circumstances and because it's better for that child. And, the, and the, the love that they have to have to let go of that child, to be trusting God for that child is incredible. Yeah. So, side note, caveat, it's a cool picture of, a, of adoption and what happens and what God does through that. Not many of us see that. But, but Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. 
And she goes down and she draws him out of the water. Now Moses, the name, sounds very similar to the word, the Hebrew word for draw out or take out of the water or rescue from the water. And it's such a cool picture because that's what happens with Moses. But as, if you know the story, that's later what Moses does with the Israelite nation as he draws them out of God, uses him to draw them out of Egypt, to rescue them out. So his name is not only literal of how he was found, but also prophetic of what God was going to use him for. It's a cool picture that we sometimes might miss in there. So Moses grows up in Pharaoh's home. His baby is looked after. His sister sees it, says, hey, I, I know a, a Hebrew mom who can look after him. And it's his birth mom. And she comes and she feeds him and cares for him in Pharaoh's house. He gets raised. He gets educated by the finest educators that, that Egypt had, the most powerful nation that we know of at that time. And he gets raised in this thing, schooled incredibly, grows up with Pharaoh's other kids. And Moses spends 40 years in Egypt under Pharaoh's thing. So it's not a short time. It's a long time. He was a little bit younger than me when he got there, when he got to the point of he had this issue. Now, we get to a point in Moses' story, so that kind of part is missing, and it jumps to where Moses sees two people, or he sees a, an, an Egyptian beating an Israelite. Moses obviously knows he's an Israelite, and so he goes up and he says, man, stop doing that. Already, again, another great picture of how God is going to use Moses to rescue the Israelites from the oppression of the Egyptians. But Moses takes it too far. He goes in his own strength and he kills the Egyptian. Buries him in the sand or whatever. Takes care of him. And then it says the next day he sees two Israelites fighting. And he goes to, goes to them and says, hey, listen, stop fighting. You know, we're in the same thing. And the one who says, well, what, are you going to kill me like you killed the guy yesterday? Moses realizes the mistake of what he's done and the trouble he's in. And he then has to flee. He leaves. Um, and he goes out into the desert. Goes out into the wilderness far away. And goes and just kind of wanders. Ends up meeting... Um, what would become his father-in-law, and becomes a shepherd for 40 years. Now, shepherds in Egypt were seen as extremely low class. They were dirty. They were not people to be associated with. So he goes, he goes from top of the pile to bottom of the pile. Having everything, living in a palace, highly educated, you know, all the food you can eat, whatever you want, to looking after someone else's sheep in the desert in the wilderness. Dirty, uh, unlooked after, just a far away from anything. Far away. And can you imagine if you, had, if you knew the promises of God over you and you then go out there? Yeah, sometimes God takes us far away. We seem like we're really far from where we should be. And you're kind of going like, God, why am I not living in my purposes? I remember one, one guy preached a sermon where he felt that and, and he had this brilliant picture that God showed him. And he said, man, I, you know, God just showed him this picture. He was drawing a, a, a cheetah. And the, like, but the drawing was, and he's like, God, you've made me the head and you've called me to lead. And he had this incredible apostolic call on his life. And he just said, like, the head is over here and, and the pencil's down here, God. Like, why am I so far away? And God showed him, man, I'm drawing the tail. You know how important a cheetah's tail is to it? It can't run or corner as fast as it does without its tail. And he said, this season in your life, I'm putting in stuff in your life that is important for what you are called to do. And sometimes God takes us far away from what looks good in our eyes to prepare us and to, to put things in us that will help us live in our calling to come. And we see that with Moses because 40 years, so he has 40 years in Pharaoh's house, 40 years in the desert of his own wilderness journey with God. And he gets a wife and kids and family. And then God calls him one day and says, while he's going about his business, he's just minding sheep. God has, and Moses has this incredible burning bush moment. Literally, the burning bush, that's where it comes from, the saying. And so he meets God in that moment, and God speaks to him. And as Kurt said, that's where he gets this thing like, who am I? And God says, it's not about you, it's about me. I want you to go and do this. And Moses has got these excuses. It's amazing how quickly, when God says, man, I want you to do this. Yeah, Lord, you know, I'm kind of busy on Tuesdays, and like Wednesdays are also full. Thursdays are a jam. And by Friday, I'm so tired, Lord. Like, we can't do this. Saturday is sport, but... You know, maybe, and we just come up with excuses, and God says, I am who I am. I've called you. Moses has this incredible encounter with God. He then goes back to the nation of Israel and starts this process of calling them out. There's the 10 plagues, goes to Pharaoh, um, 10 plagues. Eventually, God leads them out. Moses leads the nation out through the Red Sea, out into the wilderness where they wander in the desert for 40 years. And God gives this incredible law through Moses, covenant. Moses ends up being this 
amazing picture of Jesus. And so if we look at the two, if we compare Moses and Jesus, there are a lot of similarities between the two. Both were born during times of persecution. So Moses, obviously, all the boy children need to be killed. Pharaoh said that. When uh, Herod heard about Jesus' birth from the, the wise men, he then ordered that all the children, the boys in, in Bethlehem under two years old be killed. Both are born in times of persecution. Matthew, Matthew 2 quotes, um, Matthew chapter 2, speaking of Jesus, quotes Hosea 11 verse 1. He says, out of Egypt I have called my son. And, and Hosea originally speaking to the nation of Israel, but Matthew here applying it to Jesus who, to escape that persecution from Herod, went out into to Egypt to escape the physical persecution. So both of them born under seasons of persecution. Moses becomes a physical shepherd. Jesus is called the great shepherd. Both were rejected by their own people on numerous occasions. Both had periods of 40 days of fasting or separation from the community. You know, Moses went up into the mountain, 40 days up there with God, has this incredible moment. Um, time with God comes down and the Israelite nation's a bit pear-shaped, but Jesus has 40 days in the wilderness. Both were mediators of covenants given on mountains. So Moses gets that. He gets the Ten Commandments, the covenant of God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, again, sometimes we miss that symbolism, but Jesus goes the Sermon on the Mount. He goes up on a mountain to deliver the law of God. And he goes, you have heard it said, and he quotes the Old Testament law, and then he goes, but I say to you this. And so he reapplies the Old Testament law. He doesn't, doesn't do away with the Old Testament law. Remember, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. But what he does is he said, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this. So both are mediators of covenants that are given on the mountains. Both intercede and mediate for people between God. Both perform signs and miracles as evidence of their authority. And both lead people to freedom by faith in God. Both have a prophetic ministry. And this is the key for me on Moses. The key link between Moses and Jesus is the prophetic. And, and Moses as the prophet for the nation. And, and to, to understand it rightly, we need to understand what the prophet was in the Old Testament. Is the, is the prophet wasn't always someone who was foretelling. So that means the prophet wasn't always someone who was telling you what was going to happen in the future. They weren't like Nostradamuses of the Old Testament. They were people who would speak the word of God. And sometimes that gave people warnings about what was coming. But often it was just calling people back into alignment with the word that had already come. And going, man, this is what God says. You need to live like this. The what was to come was often repercussions that God had said. He said, if you don't live like this, these things will happen. But the beauty of the prophetic in the Old Testament is there's always a redemptive element to it. There's always a time where God says, man, if you live like this, this will happen. These things are going to come. If you don't do this, it's going to be bad. You're going to die. The other people are going to come and take over and you're going to be slaves. But if you obey God, he will look after you. And those are the promises that we like in the Old Testament. Those are the things that we hold on to, the Jeremiah 29, 11s, those sort of things. You go read Jeremiah 29, 10. It says you're going to be in slavery for 70 years. But don't worry. I have, you've got to read both those verses. You can't read just the one. Those are the redemptive promises of God in the prophetic in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 says, Moses speaking about what God is going to do. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. The term prophet became understood as a many messianic title, the prophet. Not a prophet, so not all prophets were, but there was the Messiah was referred to often as the prophet will come. Remember they asked John the Baptist, are you the prophet? And he said, no. John 6 verse 14 says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And again in John 7 40, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. It's a great picture of what was to come. Moses in his prophetic nature, hearing from God, speaking the words of God. That's the essence of the prophetic, is hearing from God and speaking on God's behalf. That's a, a brilliant picture of the ministry of Jesus. Sometimes we divide the ministry of Jesus up into Jesus was a prophet, a priest, and a king. Those are the three models we see in the Old Testament, and we're going to look at people who represent all of those things. But Jesus here is represented by Moses as the prophet. 
Moses shows how he hears from God and speaks what God says. And that's the prophetic. That's, that's the prophetic ministry that Jesus has. Is he comes as the son of the father going, I, don't, I, I speak only what the, I hear the father tell me to speak. I say only what the father tells me to say. That's an indication of that prophetic nature of what is coming through Jesus. Moses gave the people bread from heaven and Jesus is the bread of heaven. And then lastly, Moses in his, in his greatest, I mean, the most obvious picture is he was a type of Messiah for the Israelite nation. So he comes, he is literally their savior. He goes to the one who was oppressing them and he gets their freedom on behalf of God. So that is the picture of a Messiah that comes in and comes in and frees the nation from oppression and leads them out to God's presence. That's the picture of the Messiah. That's what Moses does. Comes, leads them out through the Red Sea and out into the wilderness and eventually they go out into uh, the promised land. So Moses ultimately is the prototype picture of what the Messiah would come and do for the world and not just for a single nation. Moses has the call of God and he feels that. And early on, he starts to take it into his own hands with those Israelites and, and various other things. And he tries to do it in his own strength with that Isra the Egyptian oppressing the Israelites. And, he, and what happens is the result of him doing it in his own strength is death. You know, sometimes God gives us a call and he places things on our lives and, 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 and gifts and talents and things in us. But if we're going to do those things and operate out of those things and just run ahead of God in our own strength, the result of that thing can very oftentimes be hurt towards other people. But when Moses, with that same call, with the presence of God, operates in the gifting that God has given him, but with God, the result is freedom for people. The slaves are oppressed and set free. So when we, got to, when we live out what God has for us, we need to not run ahead of God or just go, thank you, God, grab it and run. We've got to go, thank you, God, what do you want me to do with it? You see, that 40 years in the desert taught Moses to rely on God. He was self-reliant before that. He had everything he needed. He was wealthy, all the education, all the right standing, all the authority. And that got stripped away from him. And he had 40 years of going, okay, all I have is God. And God walks with him and meets with him and he gets to know God. And then he comes to this incredible moment of being a deliverer for his people, fulfilling the calling God has on his life. Moses says, who am I? This is what Kerr shared this morning. This part of my sermon comes from my wife. Moses says, who am I? And God replies, it's not, about, it's not about you, Moses. It's about me, God. Moses learns that over and over again. Moses constantly learns that same lesson. And eventually he gets to the point where God says to him, listen, these people, your people, God says to Moses, says, your people that you brought out of Egypt need to go away from me because I'm going to kill them. So you take them and go up into where I've told you to go. And Moses says, God, if you don't come with us, we're not going anywhere. I'm not leaving unless you come with us. What will make us different from the rest of the nations if we don't have your presence? An incredible, incredible revelation. And Moses has the security to go, I don't care what you've called me to do. I don't care who you've made me to be. You've made me prime minister of Israel, whatever it might be. I need you. We need you with us. That is more important than the promised land. That is more important than anywhere we go, your presence with us. It's a beautiful picture for us, friends. Sometimes we get so enamored with doing the things of God that we miss God. In your calling, in living out who God has made you to be, never lose sight of the presence of God with you. If God doesn't go, don't do it. Stay where you are. Wait for that cloud to move. Can you imagine as a leader? So Moses in the, in the desert, God has a pillar of uh, cloud during the day and fire at night. And he says, that's the sign of his presence with them. And God said to them, follow that, that thing in the desert while they're wandering. By the way, it was an 11 day. They could have walked that distance in 11 days from Egypt to the promised land. They walked it for 40 years. That's a long hike. Eh? That's a multi-day hike, that one. But nothing wore out. Interesting. Anyway, I, I digress. So God's presence is there in that thing. Can you imagine as a leader, you get there, the cloud stops moving. Right, we're going to set up camp. These guys to the east, these guys to the west, south. 
thing that, like this tent, and three days later that thing moves. Right, guys, we've got to move. The cloud's moving. Cheap as Moses, bro. Can you just like call the can you can you call the cloud back? Like we've just settled here. Yeah, it would have been frustrating. Pack up the tent, move the kids back on, off we go again. And that cloud moves and we go and we follow it. Sometimes that cloud might have stayed in the same place for like three months or eight months, I don't know. Nine, maybe it was a year, maybe it was more that they stayed in one place. We don't know. Moses, like we're running out of stuff to do here, bro. It's a bit boring. Can we go somewhere else? Like we walked over there and there's some nice stuff. Can we just go down there? Pillar hasn't moved. Cloud hasn't moved. We're not going anywhere. Do we have that security in ourselves to just go, man, I'm following that pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. I'm not going anywhere. Until the, until, unless the presence of God moves me on from this thing, I'm not going anywhere. It's such a cool picture in the life of Moses. Moses still in the desert, by the way, has anger issues. Moses, most of the time, it's Moses' anger issues that get him in trouble. Amen? <laughs> Just me? No? Yeah. So most of the time, that's what happens. He gets cross with things. But it, even in his anger, he's doing what God's told him to do before, but God says, that's not what I told you to do now. You know the story with the rock? Israelites have no water. They come grumbling to Moses early on in the journey. They say, did you bring us out into the desert to kill us? We're just going to, like... We're just going to die of dehydration out here. Do you want to make a fool out of us? Moses goes to God and says, Lord, thank you for bringing us out, but uh, you didn't kind of plan for this hike for this many people. We need some, you know, you didn't give us any water. It's a desert. Just in case you didn't know. And God says, I'll tell you what, take your staff and see that rock and strike the rock and water will come out of it. Okay. Never seen that before. But God's seen, Moses seen a lot of things that God has done. So he goes up, strikes a rock, truth Bob, gushing water. Beautiful picture of Jesus. The New Testament says, Paul writes in Corinthians, that that rock that gave them water, that supplied the living waters to them, was Jesus. Later on, same thing happens again. Getting there, Moses gets angry and hits a rock with a stick. And you're kind of going, but that's what God told him to do before. And God says, because of that, you will not enter the promised land. It's incredible. It's incredible what God does with Moses there. How many times do we do the right thing, but with the wrong heart? We go, man, Jesus loves you and you need to stop sinning. But I'm actually just angry with you because your sin has confronted me. It's, it's hurt me. It's, the, it's right. The words are right. But the heart is wrong. The attitude is wrong in those things. We need to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves because that's all that happens and, and it's it's an incredible picture for us how God still uses Moses mightily in that moment despite his flaws and his mistakes and all those things that go wrong God still continues to use us when we make mistakes it's usually because we're becoming self-reliant but that doesn't disqualify us from the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of love and God still using us if you are holding back, if you are, if you are stepping back from what God has, God has got for you because you have made mistakes, because you have maybe hurt others or even been hurt, I want to say to you, look at the story of Moses and look how many mistakes he makes and God still uses him. God still uses him. Moses repents. Moses still uses him. There it is, Moses. I still want you to lead. I still want you to go out and lead these people. Moses, as a prophetic picture of Jesus is a beautiful picture for us of the, of the prophetic nature that Jesus carries in his ministry and of the reliance that we need to have on God in everything God calls us to do. Even as he foreshadows Jesus that is to come, he still demonstrates to us the importance of relying on God. You know, Jesus in his earthly ministry relied on the Father. He drew away to go and spend time with God so that he could hear from God and go, and the night before he picks his 12 disciples, he goes up and he goes away onto a mountain praying about who he's going to pick. Who are these 12 that you want? God sends him down with 12 names. Incredible. Over and over again, Jesus following the Father, going out there, not looking at things around him. Thousands of followers, ministries going well, healing, feeding, ministry of Jesus. Moving on, next town. What are you doing? We've got, we've got followers. Finally, we've got some followers. Off he goes. Why? Because the Father is going there. The presence of God is there. 
Do we have the security in ourselves and who God has called us to be and to do to follow the Spirit and the presence of God no matter what? That's the message we need to get out of Moses foreshadowing Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would help us to be completely reliant on you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would highlight for us every moment that we become self-reliant. Highlight for us the words that we use that are self-reliant. Highlight for us in our daily lives, Lord, gently where we are moving away from your presence, where we are moving away from that picture of the pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. We want to have the attitude of Moses, God, where he said, if your presence does not go with us, we'll not go anywhere. Lord, set us free from the, the worry of the expectations of others and how we should be and what we should be doing and looking like. We want to be completely reliant on you, God. Let us not be so attached to the things of the past that we stay with those and not with your presence when it moves on, God. We want to move with your presence even when it is uncomfortable to do so, God. When it maybe calls us away from the familiar and what we know, help us to then be bold to follow you, God, into the unknown. And Lord, I pray that as we go into this week, Lord God, that your presence would be with us. Let your face shine upon us, God. We want to be like Moses who enters into your presence and comes away with a face that is glowing from the presence of God, so that as we go to others, they would say, man, there's something different about you. What is it? Lord, I pray that that thing be the presence of you that rubs off on those around us. Let your presence draw others through us to you, God. We want to be conduits of your grace and vessels of your instruction, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' loving name. Amen.